So what so, do you see now, right now? What is going on right now in the NHS? I world? see a lot of um, disheartened, hardworking, close to breaking clinicians, both nurses mm. and doctors and receptionists. And I'm talking about really busy emergency departments. I'm not talking about rural areas, I'm talking about in London. When I say disheartened, meaning that their, their, their heart is breaking every time they're going to a clinic. I think I'll go, I want to look at his lifestyle, his sleep patterns, his dietary habits, what he watches, what he listens to. And honestly, if, mm. I, if I was going to be his mentor, involved in him from a rudimentary point of view, in terms of fundamentally developing him and, and you know, pr- pr- in terms of progressing him as, as, a, as an athlete, as a human being, whatever it is, I want to know about those things. Welcome to another episode of the Grappling With Life podcast. My name is Mohamed Yahyawi and today I'm joined by none other than Dr. Amir, not Amir, Amir Islami. How do you say welcome in uh, Persian, bro? Or Farsi? How do you say it? How do you say it? Yeah. Um, Befamoy. Bef, just Befamoy. say it. Befamoy. 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 What is that? Mean? Well, Merabah. <laughs> I'm doing this. Merabah. It's Turkish. Befamoy. Welcome. Befamoy. 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 Come in. Come and we've come got in. none other than Sheikh Ali Islami in the house. Salam alaikum. You okay? Alhamdulillah. He's come and blessed us with his, uh, his presence. presence. Um, which is obviously Amir's dad and coach. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> we just found him on the street, man. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. <laughs> He's uh, been kind enough to come down, inshallah. So, coach. Yes. How you been, bro? Alhamdulillah, very good. Having an uh, interesting week this week. So, a lot of, you know, the whole situation of the ambulance is striking mm. and stuff. That's had a little bit of pressure on us. But it's um, the whole point about the process and striking and like thereof, you have to realize that the sign known as the inverse care law. So the people that need it the most actually receive it the least anyway. Mm. And those that use it the most need it the least. So even striking is going to affect that majority who never use the services that much anyway, 10 times more. Why? Uh, because if you think about it, you, you hardly use the services, right? But you need it the most. So I'll give, I'll give you an example. So I was working in A&E once in King George's, maybe... It was the UCC at the UCC at the time. It was an urgent treatment center, but I was navigating in, in the front desk. And it was about probably about 15 years ago. There's this old gentleman who came in. He'd actually fallen off his ladder, landed, knocked out, got up, bleeding everywhere, and put like this towel over his head. So he's come in to the front desk and he says, I feel really awful. This towel is red, but it's not, it was a <clears> white <throat> towel. It's red now, yeah? So he's like soaked through it. I've taken him. I said, what's happening? I fell off, fell from probably about know, six foot, fallen. I've hit the deck and I'm, I, I've blacked. I said, why didn't you call an ambulance? Because I don't want to disturb the ambulance. They're busy enough. So I took him into recess and he basically had a massive hemorrhagic event that to rush him into Queens, into neuro, the neurosurgery department. I don't know what happened thereafter. But do you see what I'm saying? Like he, he, he didn't, he walked after an event like that, that's, that's, that's just an ambulance. Mm. He had a head injury, it's an open head injury. He's lost consciousness and that needs an urgent scan. That should be an ambulance there and there. But so, he didn't call the ambulance. What I'm getting at is he needed the most, use it the least because his mentality is, I don't want to abuse the system. So really being overworked, mm. overrun, overstretched and undermanned. And as a consequence, I feel terrible. You feel absolutely horrendous. And most people are like that, because most people, oh no, no, don't call the ambulance. I'm like, no, no, I'm telling you, you need to call the ambulance. I'm telling you, clinician with an ambulance now. You know, safety is paramount in this in this particular so, thing. And obviously, there's people that call up for ridiculous reasons as well. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think I think what it is is sometimes it's just a lack of education, um, not not being uh, well informed about what you have and and why you should use it and when you should use it. Actually, um, you know, people asking for. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, no it, people. I heard it's, it's, health anxiety. Uh, it's, it's, it's health anxiety, right? Yeah, yeah. So Rashid obviously works as a paramedic. He, he was, was telling me you. stories where a guy got divorced and he called the ambulance, bro, because his wife divorced him. So like, but, I don't understand why we'd call the ambulance. But, but the thing bro. is, something I know it's happened. a pet painful thing. Well, <laughs> but, well, I mean, I mean so, something's happened, right? So yeah. it couldn't. Okay, the the process of the divorce. I mean, maybe maybe he's having suicidal thoughts. Maybe he's having suicidal ideation. Maybe. He's had a massive anxiety attack, yeah. palpitations, he can't breathe, things are going to collapse. And I think it's just, 
that there's this really beautiful um, Rogerian narrative. So Carl Rogers is just like father of consultation models to an extent, yeah. And one of his one-liners was, "You have to be unconditionally positive in your regard." But I teach all my trainees when I used to teach postgraduate uh, medicine to the S. The specialist trainees, the STs, and what I used to call registrars. Um, and I just call it UPR, unconditional positive regard. I said, this basically means you've got to love everyone. Mm. It's basically hippie love, like, you know, just be chill, be love, be happy, be nice. Because the opposite would be disastrous, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be chaotic if, so yeah. if you if you was like, what's your problem? What do you want? Yeah. I've come to say I'm not well. Well, well come on, just go see a farm. Like, Excuse me, I'm, I'm not well. I've come with my hands open and I'm scared. I don't know. And I think that health anxiety, you need to receive it with a level of humility. Mm. Someone has given you the ability to protect God and safeguard someone's office, someone's life. That they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna tell you things they wouldn't even tell their most beloved, close, best friends. Because it's they're so shy of that information. They're gonna open up to you about things that happened to them when they were a child. They're gonna because they want you to know everything so you can solve their problem. They're gonna tell you things that have probably no relevance to their consultation, but nevertheless will say it to you. And that level of trust, that level of amana, you can't, yeah. you can't ban an island. You have to really respect that. And I think the problem is a lot of clinicians, they talk to people, rather talking with they talk at them. So they, this whole tongue and cheek thing about, you know, what, it's called, what I call lip service, about uh, uh, paying homage to shared management. You know, you, you have to, when you say, I'm go, I'll, look, I'm going to talk to you about the management plans. I want to let, I want to ask you, what do you think? They think you're having a laugh. And I'm, I'm sincerely telling you, I'm going to tell you the options. What would you prefer? I already know what they should do, but I need to understand their dynamics. So there's many times I've, I've had a conversation with someone on the phone. I've triaged them. I've told them what X, Y, and Z, what's happening with them. I know the best thing for them is to go into hospital. They're like, but doc, I can't. Because I've got a three-year-old child who's autistic. My other child's got cystic fibrosis and she's on a, she's taking medication. She's on, my husband's gone doing overnight work. The dynamics completely changed now. I still have to risk stratify. I still have to give them an outcome. But then I'm like, look, these are the things we can and can't do. And I've got to be really, really open with you. I would have preferred you've gone in today, but this is what we're going to have to do now. And we've taken this narrative because the dynamics have changed. I can't ask you to leave your kids at home. One's got autism, the other one's got cystic fibrosis. It's ridiculous. What's cystic fibrosis? So it's when they get a collection of mucus, they can't actually... It's a genetic um, ailment. It's a spectrum of disease, actually, because it, it can be quite it can be quite mild, it can be quite aggressive. Well, they literally are having issues with certain uh, gates in their physiology in, in terms of the secretion and the productivity of secretion. And basically, it just builds up. And so they have problems with their airways, with their breathing. It's, it's a... It's a there's a lot of gene therapy now and a lot of things they're putting in. There's amazing f services they've put in place, but it's still a horrendous disease. It's like chronic, it's a chronic lung disorder, basically. It's really, mm. really, it's not, it's not good at all. I was going to ask you, um, you've been a doctor for how long now? 2003, 2002, about 20, 20 years now. 20 years, yeah. Like so 21, 20 what, years. what has been, what, what, what changes have you seen in NHS in that time? Oh, there's a uh, plethora. But if you was to kind of, things that stick out to you, all, especially in the recent recent times, but because obviously at the moment, NHS is at, it's... On its knees, man. Yeah, it's breaking point. Yeah. And people don't really understand exactly how bad it is. And you've got like an insight, but I'm saying through the years, I mean, 20 years ago when you came into the hospital, mm. what was it like? Talk us through that kind of... Um, I think... The biggest change for me from a professional point of view, the camaraderie. When I worked in a &E, I loved it. Actually looked forward to it. We're talking like 2003, 2004, when I worked with an SHO on, uh, in a &E. And that's, if you think about it, emergency department was the, was the crux. You went there for everything and anything. Then you started the development of what you refer to as out of hours, which was already there. Because don't forget, there was a, your GP, I think in the late 90s, gave up their contracts where another server, or basically a bunch of GPs would say, look, we'll do your out of hours work for you. Because back in the day, I don't know if you remember, your mom could call your GP in out of hours and he would come and see you at home. Yeah, I've never had a doctor. I, ha I, I had that. 
I thought that only just... happened in films, bro. No, it was it was actually I don't want to say his name. He was a lovely GP. I won't mention his name, but he's a really he's still alive. Actually, I see him working in a surgery. No way. And he came out to see me, and I saw memory. I'll never forget. What when you were sick? Mm. Right. I was about probably seven years old. Oh, okay, right, right. And he's been my GP since I was a kid. And we always like he'll see me in Hamilton. He's like probably in his early mid to late sixties now. Yeah, he's quite where, a young where, GP. Where, at the time. where is he from? Uh, I think he's from Asia. India, Asia. Oh, okay. India, Pakistan. One of yeah. lo- really lovely GP, very softly spoken. And he came. He came to my house. My mum called out for a home visit. And also back then, there was a lot of GPs who would get attacked because they took their medicines. There's a massive change. There's right, a huge right, change. Right. Yeah. So he, he imagine I've, he's my GP in the practice. Next thing he's in my house with his literally with his pajamas. Pajamas. And, and he, yeah, he's come. He's come from home, isn't he? He's on call. He's actually probably gonna go to sleep. With his slippers and his pajamas, I don't know. Different he, time, bro. Just look, check me so you're goes, looking at eighties, nineties, uh, uh, yeah, early nineties. No, no, no. So I was seven. Uh, I was about nineteen eighty-five, eighty-six. Can you imagine that? Crazy, yeah. isn't it? And Different so time, bro. I remember that, right? And I remember going to A and E as a as a minor, and sitting there for twenty x hours. And by the time the next day came out, I was with my mum. I felt better. We walked home. <laughs> So just sitting in What England, was the issue? Do you remember? I think I had really bad chest pain. Right. Now it would be, it would be termed, you know, costochondritis is really What's bad that? chest pain, just musculoskeletal chest pain. Right, right. So I, I basically, I remember my mom saying, I feel better, Scott, because calm then. And, and also, going back to the camaraderie, you loved working there. Everyone had your back, everyone worked here. And then what you started seeing was, because the pressure gets larger and larger, and you try to um, uh, delegate. So then you start having the beginning of out of hours which wasn't around back then because your GP had had to take on out of hours. So GP, out of hours now so out of is hours in now, hospitals now. It's hospitals now. So, you've right. got out of hours, so out of hours used to be, so when I was at SHR and A&E, there was this place at the front entrance. That so has got it at the front. Yeah, so now, now that's UTC, that's urgent care centre. So now they take on a lot of responsibility. Right. Urgent care centre is like GPs who can manage nearly all problems in the emergency setting. So they do blood tests, x-rays, they've got minors, they've got injury units. They've got uh, plasters of Paris, uh, um, uh, 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 fractures and every, the whole, they manage a lot. There's some UTCs that are still old school, just cough, cough, runny nose. And there's some UTCs or urgent care centers that they're literally A&E. Right. They well, are in a hospital. Within a hospital. You have yeah. to understand, unfortunately, it's about contracts. Mm. You have to prove to the con- con- commissioning body, look what I can do. Give me more money and I'll bring you more services. It was, and then it started becoming less about what is the best thing for the patient. And then you start having emergency departments pitch, fighting against urgent care centers. Literally like, no, we're not, we're not taking that case now. You deal with it. Or do you have an AE consultant coming into urgent care saying, why are you sending coughs and colds to us? Can't you deal with it? Like, why would we send you coughs and colds? That's not what we do. So it's literally, you're, you're playing hardball with everyone. So the point I'm getting is comrade has gone down the toilet. That's what I felt. Anyway. Is it because of the contracts and the money that's involved? So basically you had to hit certain numbers. You yeah. had a certain, another, another authority, CQC, which we all know about, because I've yeah. been speaking to you about a lot about them. They came out of nowhere about 12 years ago. Oh, so this, there was no CQC before no, that? No, you, you You had, you had the- So CQC care trust, just explained to those people that are listening. So commissioning what? quality care, uh, care, commis- care quality commissioners. So they're basically, they're good. They're really good. To be fair, we need someone it's to like regulate. It's like the Ofsted of- uh, The Ofsted of, of medicine, yeah. right? But they were more- You need more, checks and balances. Yeah. yeah. They, but they were more like TripAdvisor back in the day. Like, you know, look, this isn't great. Why didn't you try this? They've been given so much authority. They can actually say, you're not going to do this anymore. And we're going to shut you down. We're going to put you under supervision, educational supervision. If you don't do it properly, we're going to shut you. And, and to be fair, <laughs> it's six of the one and, tw- and half a dozen of the other. Right. It's really not. It's really not fair because you would have one adv- inspector going, "You guys are absolutely trash," and then the same inv- uh, advisor, another advisor comes saying, "You guys are amazing." You know, where, where is the line here? Yeah. When it's, remember we spoke about hawks and doves. So the assessments are hawks and doves. So anyway, what I'm getting is with all these pressures that have come into place, comrades got the window. People don't want to do shifts anymore. They're just literally, they're, you know, there's certain hospitals you're like, I'm not going to go work there because I'm scared. So um, when was the um... turning point? Turning point because obviously when the conservative com- government came in, they obviously they, they won't they wouldn't say, they're a lot of they stuff, yeah. to privatize. Oh, yeah. But what what started? Um, again, I didn't have no, I didn't think we were going to speak about this today, but because it's top of mind, and we'll go into our main subject in a yeah, bit. Yeah. But so, what was privatized first? 
I think or well, semi privatized, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So I think we're looking at is certain services like cleaning and those kind of things, ancillary probably, kind of stuff. Probably, yeah, ancillary stuff came in first, and then you'd have things like radiology, right? So you'd have companies saying, "Look, we can do your pictures cheaper, and then we'll get a consultant in, say, a a, a Europe, who's a qualified consultant." To review the diagnostics and to send a report. Oh, so they, they smart, sent they sent smart. off off offshore. Yeah. Basically. Okay. So you still had good consultants, but then you had sometimes poor operators, or you had good operators and poor consultants right. reading reports. And I even know I know certain consultants in in our hospitals that will not who will not allow you to use a record like that. They'll say, right, we're going to rescan you. Get one of our consultants to read it. Do you remember the recently when I called you up about a colleague of mine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His bro, his brother in law had a, a brain tumor. Yeah, Do you remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they just condemned it to death. They were like, "Oh, that's it. You've You're said done. goodbye to your." And then you had to look at it. I'm sorry, no. And then it was obviously you said, "Look, just get a second opinion." Mm-hmm. And they went to Poland. They sent the they sent the scans to a surgeon in Poland and. The guy it was a parasite, there. wasn't it? It was some parasitic. No, no, it was it was a tumor, but it was on top of the. You said it was on top of the brain. Oh yes, yes, yes. Do you yes, remember? Yes, yes, yes. It was, it was, it it was said it was either a parasite or it was yeah. on top of the brain. Yeah, yeah. So it was what you said. It was on top of the brain. So they they I don't know what what procedure they used to kind of get it out, but extended his life obviously, and he's he's a, he was able to go back to his family. And I, I think the issue is again. I, I mean, you we're not we're not. Questioning anyone's integrity as clinicians, I think it's not fair. But also, it's like it's the pressure in it. Yeah, I mean, everyone's been trained to a certain level. And everyone, you know, you've been you've passed a certain level, and you know, you got you've been accredited, and your validation is for your accreditation. So well done. But what I'm trying to say is, this is how you take privatization. I can do a job better for you and cheaper. So you put a tender out there, and commissioners say, give them a shot. And sometimes it's about look, well, we can we've only been COVID in, but we just have to look at COVID. You know, so and so's a uh, pub. Landlord got the contract for what was it? Was the gowns or whatever it was? Do you remember that, Imran? The uh, uh, who's the Ministry of Health? What was his name? The guy who got involved with oh Hancock. Yeah, Hancock. Was it it was his pub? Can you check it? It was his pub landlord. I don't want to say anything I'm incorrect about. His pub landlord got the contract for something to do with COVID. There was someone else who got a contract when they went to Turkey. They found out all the materials rubbish. Yeah, that 1.5 billion or yeah, something. I can't then, remember exactly how much. And then the, the Turkish uh, ministry felt so bad for them to look, we're going to give you some of our stuff. Just like a com- complete farcical. Yeah. It was a farcical. It was like, this is what I'm talking about. So this is privatization 101. I ne- remember. It's, it's, it's nepotism, basically. Uh, subhanAllah. I saw this video. It was a campaign for Brexit. Yeah. Uh, when did Brexit? 2016, right? Yeah. So what they did, they had a video, it was a split in the middle. So you had on one side was when we leave Brexit and one side if we stay in Brexit. And it was an older woman who called up night or whatever, called up a, a doctor. And then on one side, she's kind of, they, you see the process of her seeing a doctor, it goes into the waiting room, there's hardly any people there. Do you understand? Comical. And then there was this whole kind of narrative of that, okay, the immigration has put a... Uh, has put like a, what's the word? Pressure, uh, pressure on, on NHS. And then the other side, the other side is, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know what it is, bro? It's the reverse. And look what's happened now. It's the reverse. Uh, how, how about our cleaner who does the gym? Because I can't, get, everyone's left the country. Yeah. No one wants to work anymore because it's the same price you're making. Yeah. It's like no one sees the value of it and immigration is key. And, and I'll never forget this, this whole, do you remember when the BNP, they want a seat? in uh, Parliament, it was 2007, I think it was. 2008, maybe. No, two, 2007. That right? guy, uh, Nick something, I forgot his yeah, name. Yeah, for, not Go for the I, He's got like a... He, he, he basically, so I remember... He was in Dagenham, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was that, that part. Somewhere, of somewhere there. So he, there was this thing that happened, and I remember my consultant, was he ITU consultant or was he palliative care? He was in resus with yeah. us. And he went, right, we're going to look at this, right? And obviously I was quite impressed. Was like, well, this is not the kind of thing I would say, but. So what, that, that, that MP was in? No, no, no. The, what I'm saying is 
when when they when when they won that seat, people got panicked a little bit, you know. Right. Oh, we're going to be sent away. All this kind of right, you know, right, oh my right. god, how are they get into power? You know, this whole Trump mentality. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, we're going to get kick all of these foreigners out. And then the consultant, he's an English fella. I forgot his name. He's an. Uh, doesn't he's matter. An, it doesn't matter. But he's a really good consultant. Yeah, really, yeah. really good English guy. Amazing consultant. I learned a lot of my uh, palliative care stuff from him. And he said, um, right, let's just look at the ratio of patients to doctors and look at the, uh, if you want, the the nationality of the patients and the nationality of the doctors. Yeah. Let's just look at it right now. He goes, okay, I want to count the amount of nurses and doctors who are of foreign heritage. So obviously it does, and he says, just count, count, count. So there's, you know, a few consultants were black. We had a few, so Afro-Caribbean, we had a few Asian, Filipino nurses, lots of Filipino nurses, bless them. Um, uh, but basically a mix, but European, a lot of Polish nurses, nurses from uh, Eastern European bloc. Was right. Now, so the majority of doctors working and nurses working in South End, obviously, there's a lot of English doctors and nurses as well, but a lot more. Uh, uh, were for, from different cohorts, you know, different nations, different heritage, but all English, second or third generation. Yeah. Because now let's look at the patient cohort. Count how many patients here and what's the majority of them are from an, uh, you know, from a Caucasian cohort or from a mixed origin cohort. Majority were English, Caucasian. Just to be right, because that part of the demographic the demographics is, yeah, is more like that. That's what that you, it reflects that. I'm sure if it was in hacking, it would be different. He goes, now imagine we told all these nurses and doctors and, you know, all of the reception staff, all these people that make up our team, right, clear off. Who's going to suffer the most? Yeah. Because it's going to be the cohort who we've just numbered out who are mainly English Caucasian. He goes, so it's absolutely discombobulating. It's ridiculous to think that you're going to clear out these, these, these people. It's ridiculous. He goes, you know, and, I mean, you just have to look at our nations and our children and where they come from. They're a mixed bunch. Mm. Your kids are mixed. My kids are mixed. All, you know, everyone is, there's no such thing as a, this is person is straight from this, this, this lineage. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, I don't know if we got to this topic, but we got there somehow. But if I'm getting at is the pressures the contracts, the lack of humility, you kind of lose your intention. Why would you become a doctor for? Because of all of these things. Um, so what so, do you see now, right now? What is going on right now in the NHS? I world? see a lot of um, disheartened, hardworking, close to breaking clinicians, both nurses oh. and doctors and receptionists. And I'm talking about really busy emergency departments. I'm not talking about rural areas. I'm talking about in London. When I say disheartened, meaning that their, their, their heart is breaking every time they go into a clinic. Did you not see that WhatsApp group? Yeah. That, uh, was that 50,000 doctors and nurses? I didn't even know you can have 50,000 on a WhatsApp group. I don't know how many it was. So it was like some ridiculous <laughs> it was message. a lot, yeah. It was, like it was a lot, message. it was a big, big did you, group. Did you not yeah. see what some of the messages were? They were saying that they, they were doing reverse triage. Was so, it called reverse triage? Yeah, they're taking someone out of ITU to bring someone into ITU. You know, they're taking someone out of resus, uh, critical resus to allow that person to die in peace. So that he doesn't die in the hallway, innit? Basically. Yeah. This is... They, they, had, they had that... It's not even COVID. Junior, junior doctor who was triaged tri tri in the street. Oh, yeah. Cosmic, are you still alive? Are you still breathing? What do you reckon that does to someone, bro? It can't it's be fun. War. It it's basically fun. war, bro. It can't be fun. Like World War One, World War Two, like... Uh, but on, at least on, then, uh, at least then, at least then, it had to be done. Yeah. Well, I remember speaking to a consultant and we was complaining about the hours and I was saying, you know, I was a junior doctor doing like 107 hours a week and it was painful, 101 hours. Registrar yeah. goes, because I was doing a one in three, which means every three, every third. So I was doing a one in four, every four nights you're on call. And then when you do a set of nights, you do seven nights in a row. So you start eight in, in the evening, finish at eight in the morning, and then you do a post-eight ward round to two o'clock in the afternoon. Just do the maths. Right. But so where I, do you I, sleep, bro? Yeah. Did doctor, they have um, quarters where you slept and stuff? Yeah, you slept on the, on the couch or on the doctor's no bed or in, or in the mess. Um, so they've done this, right? And I remember saying to Registrar, Registrar goes, Registrar goes, I don't know, one in three. Don't complain. So every third night, I don't know. Consultant goes, I don't know, one in one. <laughs> <laughs> What's like, that? Every, every night you're on call, every day you're on call. I was like, but in my head, but you was the only doctor there. So the energy you had yeah. was because you said no one else. I took that flag. Yeah. 
But well, there's hundreds of us now, but you're treating us like dogs. You're not protecting us. You're not guarding us. Or you're, or you're not putting systems in place that, but it's just, <laughs> you saw the messages, isn't it? And there was yeah. that big thing on the news about it. And uh, it's, it's just, um, it's just getting worse. Uh, it, it I, goes I hand to... in hand with immigration. So this, 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 I was, I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, you know what? I feel like. Okay. Um, can I just bring a point about yeah, this? Yeah. How hard is it to get into medical school? It's nearly impossible. impossible. Yeah, almost impossible. It's yeah. nearly impossible, isn't it? It's nearly impossible. So I use my son as an example, yeah? Moshe's a good student, you know, doing really well. Um, UCAT met A-levels, done really well, but missed out on a, a grade or so. So now he's doing uh, uh, like biomedicine in St. St. George's to get to med school. Yeah. I'm like, you've got somebody who desperately wants to get into medicines, working their heart out. And you're making their life 10 times harder. And then you're telling them at the end of it, you're going to have a 60 to 100,000 pound debt you've got to pay off. Yeah. Look at the obstacles in the way. And so, and a lot of people just go into Australia, bro. Yeah, but I'm trying to say, as in, the thing is, building someone up in medicine is like growing an oak tree. Yeah. It takes years and years and years. So you're making the initial process the hardest. Yes, I appreciate why, because then you don't want, you don't want, to, you don't want any, you know, Tom, Dick or Harry getting into med school with no ability, but don't make it so hard that even people who have got good credits can do it. Because I've seen the process of getting into med school. I've witnessed people being given unconditional offers. That means you could flunk all your A-levels and get into med school. Mm. Because your character, we want this. There's a kid who was like, um, played for Tottenham Hotspurs Junior. What, you know, they have these, and he said, they said, well, you know, you're going to lose. He goes, I've given up my career to do football, to do medicine. I remember the consultant just saying, right, when he left, unconditional. Unconditional, I was like, unconditional, but for what? Obviously, I didn't understand the impact of football. Well, I wasn't into football. He's given up a multi-millionaire possible lifestyle to be, or even multi-billionaire, to come and work as a doctor, which is not going to give you much credit, mm. apart from what your int intention was for. So I've seen that. So for me, it's like, don't, don't tell me that there's these criteria. There are criteria to stop, you know, Checks and balances stop useless people trying get to get in, in yeah. because it becomes like, oh, anyone can do it. But don't make it so hard. There's so much red tape. The people that read it, you should be doing it. You're struggling now. Now you're talking about immigration. There's a thing called the golden handshake. So back in the day, they had to get doctors in, right? So they'll give them 10,000 pounds, bring them in, set them up as a partner in a GP practice. Now these are doctors. And again, I'm not questioning the integrity and the ability of these doctors, but if from parts of the world that... Their culture is big time going to clash with our culture. When I say our culture, I mean, we're born and raised in the UK. When we've you got, say culture, you mean the medical... The medical school, culture, yeah. the way you... I mean, I've seen doctors... Our bedside manner. Yeah, I've seen um, doctors talk to nurses from other nations, the, the, you know, regardless of what the nation's from, speak to the nurse like she is a second-class citizen. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the most dangerous thing you can do because, you know, nurses are the skeleton of the services, you know? Without them, we collapse. Yeah. So when you rub the nurse the wrong way up, and she tells the rest of the girls in the ward, they're like, right. Yeah, let's stick together. It's this good. guy's going to yeah. get it. Yeah. And he, he really got it good. You know? Wow. Well, anyway, so. Okay, so. Um, it's another time. Well, it was good to come because obviously it's uh, topical, isn't it? Um, but I feel like this one thing that's been, like in the last few weeks, I've been having a lot of guys at the gym coming to me saying, asking me, um, you know, how do I stay in shape? Um, what's the best practice, especially when it comes to grappling and, you know, training. And, and I know um, you're very regimented in what you do. And we always talk about, you know, optimizing, not just there's kind of surviving and then there's like optimizing. Because naturally when you go on YouTube or you're always looking at the top 1% of athletes yeah. and like sometimes that narrative doesn't apply to you because you're, you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. They started from somewhere. So if you're looking at an athlete when they start, for example, as a kid, they, 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 they're working on their balance, all these things. It, it What's the word? It, it accumulates, it accumulates mm -hmm. right? And then they've got a really strong foundation to build yeah. the technique, the skill, the, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. So yeah. let's take a, someone 21 years old. Yeah. yeah? Maybe they're, they're, they just started training. Yeah. 
how would you take that if you were if you were their kind of their mentor, their PT, whatever it is. Their coach, their PT, and, and you had you had like a few years with them and they were gonna to listen to everything that they say you say to them. How what would you start off with first? I, I think I'll look as at, a coach. So yeah. think about Kane, because Kane's coming in next week, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So Kane had a strong base judo background. Yeah. Wrestle he, for a little bit. He, he, he was re- he was ready in the making. Yeah. So that okay. So, yeah, so if, but if you take, obviously looked at him. Yeah. And and started at a point at where a point. I felt yeah he's ready to move from that. Point. Yeah. So I'm saying before, before that, that before point. you get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll, I want to look at his lifestyle. Right. His sleep patterns, his dietary habits, what he watches, what he listens to. And honestly, if mm. I, if I was going to be his mentor, yeah. involved in him from a rudimentary point of view. In terms of fundamentally developing him and, and you know, pr- pr- in terms of progressing him as as a, as an athlete, as a human being, whatever it is, I want to know about those things. Um, how many hours is he sleeping? Is he having deep slumber sleep, REM sleep? His dietary habits. Is he having sugars? No sugars. Is he drinking plenty of water? Is he two to three liters of water, of water a day? Is he eating foods that are inflammatory, like certain things like gluten, dairy? Is he negating those from his diet? Is he having organic food? Pro- uh, in his process, is he looking at fasting? I'm talking about proper fasting, not intermittent fasting. Uh, and also things like his behavioral patterns, also doing for his mindfulness. Obviously we have prayers, we have remembrance, we have time to reflect in our prayers. Um, are you negating certain vices in your life? These are important for me because what you don't want to do is just have a shell and the inside mm-hmm. is corrupted. You want to grow it from the inside out. Because at the end of the day, if I if I if I just pack on muscle on you and make you really strong, but actually you're you've got a weak character, things in you. So when it's time when the calamity strikes, you're in a wrestling match, you're going through a lot, you hurt a limb, are you ready to push through? And I think all these things will be as a consequence of your inner being and how you manage your lifestyle and who you are in the daytime, how you behave with people. Look at our circle of people that we train. People who come in with a habit of being rough, rude, and you know. Ronin mentality, they don't last very long in Legion. We just don't put up with it. And I think that those things are key for me. So why do I you- I think s- nearly the same as Shaolin Temple, right? Yeah. You have that kid outside doing horse stance for six months in the rain. Then you go, yeah, you're ready, let's go. So why do you feel like the internal is more important than external? Because that's the thing that will keep you going when the rest of your body shuts down, man. When you break a limb, when you lose the, the will, when I say the will, your body loses its will, but your internal frameworks, your software, software just keeps on moving as we can do this. We can do this, you know, in spite of all the calamity, like I can do this. And this is what I see. So a lot of people who the outside looks great, but the inside is broken. And that, that's, that, that's like putting a, a bandaid on a shotgun, shotgun wound, as they say. So how would you do it? What do you mean? Fix the internals. Yeah. So how would you do it? So if you put someone, like, well, we're talking about optimization here. Yeah. Yeah. So but optimization, can't, imagine, but it's not in silo. It is, it is, it's multifaceted. Of course. Of multidisciplinary course. approach. You can't, there's too many things happening. Yeah. If it's just, oh, how do I make my biceps bigger? Yeah. No problem, yeah. bro. I can help you with that all day long. But if you're saying, how do you help me optimize as a human being? Yeah. There's a lot to it. There mm. was that doctor who would live with, you see that doctor that lives with people? There's an um, Asian doctor, he's a really funny guy, he done a talk on diabetes and the curative function of how you can cure diabetes. And it's true, you can cure it. Because we know that when you put someone through bariatric surgery, suddenly they don't become diabetic anymore. We're, mm. not, talking, we're not talking about type one. These are type two, yeah. We're talking about people who have acquired, right? Acquired diabetes. And unfortunately, they end up going on insulin products because they get resistance to diabetes. Um, in terms of they, they get resistance to insulin, they need they, the, the, the oral therapy is important insulin instead. I'm talking about you put someone through bariatric surgery, suddenly they're not diabetic anymore. So mm. it's, it's curative. You know, there's a study actually showing about, um, you know, aging males and using testosterone in aging males. And there's a study in Australia which actually has a 40% um, resolution of diabetes, un- unheard of. So you can correct certain things in someone's mechanisms to get rid of those ailments. But the point I'm getting at is it has to be something, um, it's, it's, more, it's, it's multifactorial. So you can't just say, right, I'm going to work on this part of you. So this, this, this doctor actually lived in the patient's house 
looked at their things and said, oh my God, like threw all of their food out, said, we're going shopping. Right. That's number one thing. Let me look at your food. What are you doing? Looked at their sleep patterns, watching films to one in the morning, talking mm -hmm. about blue light, the effect it has on your brain patterns, on your dopamine. All these things shut them down, shut them down. Yeah, so I'm thinking about someone who just, who's a young man who's at a university. Number one, make sure you're getting up at the break of dawn, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, get up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Get some sunlight. Well, look look at Mark Wahlberg, right? You've seen his life, haven't it? Just no. look at his pattern. It's crazy. He wakes up at 4.30 in the morning. He does his meditation, whatever that is. Yeah. Then he trains from 5 to like 6.30 in the morning and then his day starts. So what's your morning routine? So obviously we, we wake up, try to wake up early, you know, uh, pre-dawn, try to do those prayers where you call, you know, early Fajr, yeah. well, before Fajr if we can. Oh, it's the hard. Um, uh, if, 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 yeah. if you can, if you can. Yeah. I'm and talking about you, bro. You, yeah, so you. then break it down for us. We want to open okay. up the yeah, and then going to the morning prayer in the mosque if you can make it, and then from there you're up. I like to use the gym in the morning, so there's a nice. So local what time gym. Do, you, do you? So what time do you get up? About five thirty six. Five thirty six. And then if, if it's if you, you might do tahajjud. Yeah, yeah. If not, then fajr's at six forty five at the masjid. Six thirty the masjid pray. Then your day kind of starts. All right. I might do a little bit of paperwork, a little bit of reading. And then I would hit the gym about, say, 7.38. Um, and I'll use the gym. Obviously, the gym I use is a community gym. The reason why is we've got a swimming pool. So I can't run because of my knees. Um, rowing is tough on my lower back. Those are the two things I love doing, running and rowing, if we could. Yeah. So now what I do is I do weightlifting. And I've got what's called an ABC split. So I do uh, uh, chest and triceps, back and biceps, legs and shoulders. And I do that as a six-day split. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday is my sparring day or podcast day. <laughs> um, and I do that in the morning. And then after I've done my lifting and I've got certain sets of moves that I do, I've got to do it carefully because obviously I'm, you know, I'm not like a spring chicken anymore. And then I go swim. I swim for about So you do your minutes. weightlifting first, then you swim. Swim straight away. Swim for 20 to 30 laps. So, so Length, swim right? first, then go weightlifting or the other way no, around? No, no, weightlifting first. Right. Why, why do I weightlift first? Strength training basically. Strength training, but also I'm using, uh, using my residual uh, uh, glycogen stores for my liver. That's the best kind of thing to use. And then when you do cardio what, thereafter. What, sorry, what's the significance so, so of that? The, you're, you're using good sugars. Your, your, your glycogen storage is being unloaded when you're weightlifting, yeah? So this is before breakfast. Then, is you know? is what Would you have so breakfast yeah, first? Apologies, yes. Yeah. So in the morning, I'll have like my vitamins and minerals. So vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, uh, omega-3 fish oils, uh, milk thistle for the liver and just for normal detox. What else? Obviously, some uh, other medication I use for my health. Uh, uh, iron, ta uh, iron, iron supplements as well. And then I have like a very small, uh, uh, maybe like a little bit of, um, I never have protein before I train because I get bloated. So I have like a little bit of banana with peanut butter and a black tea. So half a banana, a little bit of peanut butter on top, <laughs> knock it back. <laughs> okay. And, a black and a, like an Ahmed chai black tea. Yeah, yeah. And then I take my pro, I take my BCAAs, which is a branch, a branch chain amino acids um, drink. Or ECWAs. You drink that, or you drink that on the I drink way. I drink that at the training when I was oh. on training. So I have it in a container of ice. I take that with me. So I do my weightlifting, depending on whatever day it is, and then that the hands my stomach is not so bloated, and then I'll swim afterwards. So twenty to thirty lengths. Then after I finish swimming, I do my underwater breath breathing technique. So I do the Wim Hof breathing. By the way, don't do this unless someone is with you. Right. Because if you do the Wim Hof and you black out, you're going to drown. <laughs> you're going to submerge and fall asleep. So I've done it for years, so I'm okay. And that's his disclaimer, don't do it. In so do swimming. Wim Hof before, you, not underwater, because you can't no, breathe I, underwater. I, I, do, I, do, I do it, I do it. <laughs> in to, between. So I do it, we, we, so I do the Wim Hof um, hyperventilation process. This is when? Uh, this is, so when I finish my 20, 30 lengths. Okay. Then I'll do Wim Hof. In the pool? In the pool, yeah. You must so, look like a lunatic in there. I bro. do. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? I'm fine, just breathing. <sighs> you, know, it's a, you know, and then I go under. Right. So oh, so, so, okay, right. So the first round, I get about probably, get to about 40, 45 seconds, not very long. Second 45 round, seconds underwater? Yeah, holding breath. Second round to about a minute. Third round to about a minute and a half. And then, obviously, then I do what's called, I try to do one length underwater in one breath. All right. And then I come out and there's a sauna there and I sit in the sauna for 10 minutes and it's usually empty. That time of the day, no one's there, but it's there. And you know, cattle. Yeah. 
such a beautiful place. It's a community gym, mainly older people. Older people. Do you sit in a sauna and then did you steam? <laughs> no, no, I just do sauna. Sauna. No, there's yeah. no steam, but I just do sauna. But you see Avatar, the, the new Avatar. I was watching the behind the scenes because they shot it underwater. Oh, yeah? So there was, uh, you know, Kate Winslet's in it, I think. And uh, she? yeah, she's in it. And is she one of the. Signori the, Weaver. They, the they held their breath for six minutes underwater, bro. Mm. Well, so you know, technically, you, you know, she can hold her breath can. longer than you, bro. But do you know what the Olympic. You know, Olympic, you know what the world record is? It's like 20 minutes, isn't it? So like, what? One hour! You can watch it on YouTube. He hyperventilates on oxygen, goes under one, holds his breath. Did you see one the, um, the I, I think it's in the Philippines or something. There's the guy that does uh, deep, deep water diving without- I think. Yeah. He fishes like that. Yeah. He goes- He's probably got, his lung capacity is greater. His tidal volume is better. He's probably got- Imagine so, this guy rolling with you, bro. He yeah, could hold stopped. his breath and roll with you at the same time. So the thing is, you think about it, why does that happen? So why do you start breathing suddenly to breathe? Because CO2 levels build up. So you need to expire the CO2. Right. Not just oxygen. So when you hyperventilate, <sighs> what happens there? So you're trying to push O2 up, which is not, because O2 is set, 21%. Yeah. What you're really doing is you're trying to dispel CO2. So you're trying to make yourself more alkaline, right? Right. So by breathing off more CO2, and what happens is when you hold your breath, CO2 starts climbing again. Mm. And that forces you to want to breathe up. And you breathe in again. So they were, they were, they were talking about the, because they, they had a specialist. SubhanAllah, I wish I could bring it up, bro. But um, you know, breathing. Yeah, he, he goes amazing. that it's the mind. He said it's the mind. The mind if, you, if you can, when you get to a point where you want to breathe, he was talking about, there's a technique that he uses. Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah, he yeah, said, yeah. paint a picture in your mind or yeah, yeah, he yeah. goes, go to a place. You actually, you can actually close yourself down. Yeah. So but he was nevertheless, saying, you still have to get rid of this. Of course. The yeah, yeah. There's a point. But the point is, how does that guy stay on the wall for one hour? I mean, yeah, let's talk about that's it. That's crazy, man. It's mad. Amazing, bro. And I have to be honest, you know, you're underwater and I, and I rate water. We're, we're made mo mostly of water, yeah. right? Mostly. 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 <laughs> We're mostly made of water. So there's a wisdom in being in something you're made of. So the swimming? Yeah. So you jump in the sauna. What's the, what's the purpose of the sauna? So there's something known as heat shock proteins and you elevate the temperature of your body. So it's like, it's the reverse of cryotherapy, right? So shocking your central nervous system in cold water. And likewise, the reverse would be to heat, turn up the heat. And there's this whole thing about heat shock proteins and what they do to the immune system and how they, you know, implement this kind of inflammatory process uses as a positive impact on your immune profile and on your recovery um, and your central nervous system. So there's the loads to it. There's like loads and loads of literature. But in English, um, basically, what's the benefits recovery. of recovery? Recovery, regeneration. What's your opinion on ice baths and yeah, cryotherapy? Same, and same, stuff? Same, same thing. Have you done yeah, ice I, baths I, before? So, so not really, but when you jump in a freezing cold pool, <laughs> After you've been doing it's not, I mean, ice, ice, I yeah, mean. But I have to say, they say the pool is 27 degrees. I don't believe that. <laughs> I jump in and I'm like, oh, I can't yeah. breathe, I'm freezing. And then I know it's cold because my body goes, I start having really bad, uh, you know, histamine release. And I start itching every and I'm like, just oh, calm down, okay, calm down. Right, right. It's freezing, going like, bruv, this is not 27 degrees, it's like 18 degrees, mate. <laughs> you know? Um, but I heard that swimming, correct me if I'm wrong, bro. Mm. Swimming is really good for fat loss because- Of course it is when you're swimming, there's a certain process that happens in the body. Is it homeostasis? homeostasis so homeostasis is obviously trying to- So it's regulating regular, that. Yeah. So they need to, it needs to burn more to keep you warm, in so it? Or something what, like this that. This is why I like weightlifting. Yeah. Because you're burning muscle throughout, you're burning fat throughout the process. Right. But because you're now ripping muscle and muscle has to regenerate yeah. to develop, yeah. you're using fuel after you've trained. Right. There's actually a nice way of losing fat as well. So the same thing with, with, with swimming, swimming as well. Swimming is different because I think your, your body's obviously shocked in that kind of yeah. state and you don't feel the burn. Right. And it's calorie, uh, you burn a lot of calories as swimming, well. Swimming, yeah. So there's a lot more yeah. calorie burning in swimming than you have probably in jogging, to be fair, because it's a whole body workout and you're in a yeah. cold medium. Yeah, that's it. It's something about being in the water that something your body, amazing. yeah. yeah. Something um, amazing. And, and you do that every day. If, well, swimming, every, except for Thursdays, because I've got a long day on clinic. Yeah, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. 
I'm always trying to come, bro. But cattle's a bit far, bro, man. What time do you get to cattle? Early morning. We're going to give away our whole schedule. People, we're going <laughs> to. The three people that listen to this podcast are going <laughs> to show up. They're going to come to cattle. I'll show you, coach. So, what I used to do is, I used to take all of the wrestlers with me. Right. I used to get quite wild in the gym. Is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll you mean out. in the swimming pool? And no, in the gym and then go to the swimming pool. Like six, seven guys jumping. But in what the time pool. do you get to cattle, roughly? I kind of get there early morning because I start early. Like if I can get there between seven and eight in the morning, that's good. Right. And two hours there plus the swim, plus the sauna. Sometimes I can't hit the sauna, but I think for me, swimming's paramount. Mm. I'd rather. I'd I rather, think for me, I want to. I want to try it. I don't, I don't have to swim in it. So it's amazing. Man. We spoke about the whole thing, Doctor Ino, Ino, Inomata in Japan, who done that study of water, and in one oh, vessel, oh right, wrote these yeah. horrible words. Now, rest we wrote really happy words and took stills of the electron microscope and showed what happens to water. Yeah, it affects the... They were talking about as well, like from a technological point of view, storing data within water. This, this it's crazy because what they did, was they put they put a, a, a flower inside a cup of water mm. and they looked at the molecules and it was the shape of the flower. Mm. It was this kind of... So they, well, they, so water does... does um, well, Islamically, in the Ayan Quran, we create everything from water. Yeah. So I was having this discussion with a lifeguard where she said... Did you know evolution? I said, no, no, actually it's in the Quran that everything comes from water. And she went, I said, yeah, well, we believe that is what is the medium that everything comes yeah, from. From life, yeah. From life. And I was like, oh, and I said, yeah. But Allah said this in the Quran already. So yeah. anyway, so finish swimming, sauna, come back, and then I'll have a How meal. do you feel at that point? Absolutely amazing. Feel tired, but feel amazing. Feel refreshed. Do you ever feel like sleepy or? Um, I do get sleepy later on. Well, what that's time? my age. Probably about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, that, that two, three o'clock slump, bro. Yeah. It's very hard to get around that because you trained early and there's a wisdom in having that siesta. I can't because I'm working. Mm. So I just have to slow down my work. I heard, you know, this guy, Dr. Huberman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Such a good, uh, he, he said that to get over that slump, it's to do with the caffeine that you drink, bro. Yeah, yeah, did you listen to that? Um, I've had a read of that and I've looked at that. There's wisdom in it. But I don't have caffeine, bro. Yeah, After that's the that problem. I think if you, you had caffeine, it'd be really... you'd be like gummy bears, bro. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, because you're already on a lomobatic. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I find that, so and I have a protein shake afterwards. I have a, a turn, an, an isolate that, that sits well with me. I put porridge oats in it because that gives me the recovery I need, or the calories I need to recover. I have my protein up to 30, 40 grams, put berries in there, uh, a little bit of peanut butter in there as well, a little bit of essence and put it in water. And put essence? It in, you know, the vanilla essence. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Extra, you know, the essence. Yeah, extra, extract. So, and then I put that in the water, put it in the ninja, whiz it up and that's my meal done for the morning. So that's your breakfast? That's my breakfast after training. And then afterwards I'll have like, um, maybe a, 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 something like a, a tuna or chicken with rice midday. That's why you probably fall asleep. Isn't it? Does the rice make you sleepy, no, bro? No, 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 Like a little bit, just calories. You need calories, bro. Yeah, you need day. calories, yeah. And then later on, I have a protein bar with some black tea and then some mineral water throughout the day. And that's it. That's me done. Oh, but then you've got training. And now, that's I've got training in the evening. But don't forget, I'm coaching. Yeah. I'm not really an athlete anymore, am I? And you see me on, I try to get involved. Do no, but I, me I measured my coaching last time on my whoop, yeah? Quite a bit of calories lost. Bro, um, it was, the strain from coaching was more than my jiu-jitsu class afterwards. Mm. I don't know what it is. I, I try to get involved in the class. But I feel like your heart rate, because you're, you're kind of explaining, and you're, you're, you're demonstrating the moves, mm. you're walking around. Huh? Same. Yeah, so I feel like my strain is more when I'm coaching. It's weird, bro. Maybe I'm, not, obviously, maybe I'm not pushing myself enough in jiu-jitsu. I don't know what it is. Maybe not, yeah. I think I find that coaching is hard, but yeah, I'm, I don't, that's why I don't have to eat so much afterwards. Right. Do you I, eat after training? After, so obviously. When, when I'm being strict, no. Yeah. When I'm being naughty, yes. Okay. So, so you don't need many calories in a day, bro. Yeah, that's it's the thing. So I feel like I, when I, when I started, I started to stop eating after six o'clock. So, you know, when I go to coach. Yeah. So I start coaching at six. So I stop eating about five o'clock. So if, if you, but if I find you, myself ravenous, bro, after that. Yeah, so then eat. No, but then I can't sleep properly. Well, that's what I'm saying, but eat, eat well. Don't eat rubbish. Like, like, even if I try, for example, I try and have a... Um, grilled chicken. Whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, I'll with it. But I find that I can't sleep on time. But why? 
I don't know, I just can't fall asleep because I've got yeah. a food in my stomach, man. Think about it. We finished training on Monday at what time? 10 o'clock, 10.15? Yeah, yeah. So in that situation, By the time, be, yeah, that's what I'm saying to you. So drink some water and go to sleep. Yeah, that's it. But I'm ravenous, bro. Yes. So then it's just- the mindset. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, Even it's, me and Musa have this joke. He goes, dad, I'm really hungry, but no. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to sleep now. And I'm like, wow. Well done, yeah. son. But I, I feel like having. A... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna eat chicken burger. <laughs> but I feel like breakfast is a time where you kind of. So again, when you go to sleep and you wake up in your empty stomach, you feel much better. So when I go and train, yeah. I make sure I have a really good that post training meal yeah. in the morning is yeah. really important. Right. That's why I put the porridge, the banana, the peanut butter. Yeah. That's when I go to I town. I might try that, man. And in midday, you have that chicken salad rice. That's you. And you you eat the same thing every day, isn't it? <laughs> I like that. I like because it's just too much to. Th- so you don't think about it. I go for that bonus platter with five lads. <laughs> oh, is, it? is that what you shout out five lads? <laughs> so yeah. you have what? You get chicken, half a chicken, and then it's bonus chicken, um, no flavor. So it's no, just flavor. no flavor. It's just grilled man, chicken. You're deep, bro. I know. Not even lemon herb. Nope. No man. Why? Full of fat, man. Full of oils. Full of like sugar. You don't need it. You what you do is you, you get put some, salt and pepper or whatever. No, no. What? what you do is you make your own sauce. So one little tub of chili. Yeah. A little bit of mayo, because then you can count the calories. And that becomes the sauce. Right. Because there's not much calories in chili sauce, by the way. And mayonnaise is, is quite... Um, ma- 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 <laughs> I think it's time, bro. It's time. It's time. So ma- mayonnaise has got that much calories, especially if you take, you know, you know, low-fat mayo. For everyone that's listening, we've got Uncle here. He's and tapping uh, he's tapping his thigh. He's like, like, hey, hurry up. Time to go home. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he... he um, yeah, we're almost done. Now. Trying, so that's my meal in the day done. And then... Obviously, look, if you're expending more calories through training, you need to replace them. So a good example is uh, Mike, Philip uh, Phelps, Mike, uh, yeah. him, the swimmer. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. Yeah. He has about 10,000 calories a day. That's a lot, Habibi. So he's probably burning like 8,000. But if you look at him, he's like his, yeah. um, but he's in the pool probably about six hours a day. Yeah. And he's swimming 100, 200, 300 lengths, but that's not a joke. And you see all the cupping marks, and the deep yeah. tissue physio. He needs to eat. You need to eat. You need to eat. You need fuel replacement, bro. And and you need to eat well, by the way. Like, like good food, good, good food, whole not, foods. Not trash, yeah, not yeah. just chocolates and crisps and sweets, but good food. And what you'll find is eventually you'll, f- you'll find what I call your sweet spot. What what you, you like know, and yeah, what I'm you... going to eat that. Yeah. I, I'm, my brother Moss is, quite, Moss is quite good. Like he, he knows his body type and he goes, right, I'm going to eat a cake. And he'll eat a cake for a day or two and he'll go, right, I know I'm what I'm going to do now. Yeah. I've got five days where I've got to do this now. Most is the same. Most has kind of found his sweet spot of his eating. And also, your anatomy is everyone's different. Yeah, and it's different. So the you know, and, stuff. and I think all these, you know, these wild people on the internet talking about, you know, you can eat what you want, and I tell you what to do. I'm really sorry, but you're probably taking testosterone. I'm not telling you one. Good yeah. example of a liver of, king. Yeah. Shout out to liver king. Bro. Stop! Stop! Stop doing that. Yeah. Stop! Be, oh, come on, man. What are you selling your product? Be yeah. honest. Look, to get us an eight pack and be really muscular and built. And I'm in my face. Guy's got a turtle food. shell on his stomach, bro. It's ridiculous. But what I'm trying to say is, yeah. you know, tell people the truth. Be honest and be upfront, be open. Yeah, I know there's younger people that can do it. You've got some really good genetics. And, you know, my dad was a good example when he was young. You see his younger pictures, he was ripped. And he didn't take anything. But, but I think we're talking about here, we're talking about... The aging male, Muhammad. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying in general, like most people just want to be fit and healthy, bro. Absolutely. Like, I mean, being but don't, Mr. But Olympia... Don't, but, don't, but, don't, but don't lie to them and say to him, you're going to yeah. look like me if you eat um, liver and, and bison, yeah. bollocks of a bison or yeah. testicles. And I was like watching thinking, my God, this guy's And it's real. raw as well, bro. And so you, you're saying a lie. You, you, you're using a, a lie. And he probably does eat those things. But, but um, you can't get a body like that. Just like by that. eating them. I'm so yeah. sorry. That's not going to work like that. You have to have super physiological levels of testosterone pumped into you to look yeah. like that. And, and the good thing, shout out to all the Olympians who go, yeah, we, we, of course we do, yeah. And when we're not doing it, it's because we've got to be off cycle because it's Even Donna Cerrone was talking about recently. Did you hear what? Mm. He, he started TRT because he's, he's retired now, yeah? Mm. Because I feel like I'm 21. I can train, I can... Yeah. Like, and the thing is, you think about his, what he's done to his body over the, you know, yeah. 20 yeah. years of fighting. So we know, we know when, you, when you're constantly cutting weight, yeah. we know that um, uh, athletes who get hit to the head, test levels are low. Cutting weight generally, test levels are low. What happens to women? Who are, who are losing loads of weight, they lose their menses, they could become mm. amenorrheic, which means no periods for years. Because, and how do you get it back? Like put weight back on a little bit. 
It's weird, isn't it? Weird. And that's the thing. Stuff. I feel like testosterone gets a little bit of a like TRT, especially TRT for if you're not competing, and you you yeah, I'm 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 not just talking about athletes. If if you're an older man and you get to a point like where, but especially now there's I want to do a podcast on this specifically, yeah, inshallah, yeah, we'll bro, talk because about it, yeah. the. There's obviously natural. If you're a young man, there's you know you've got no need for to, to do TRT. But as well, you get, do, do, do you? Have no I'm just need? saying. I'm just saying. Do, like we have to be careful here, right? Because we have seen a lot more younger men. Yes, health optimization is key. I'm yeah. not saying we push hormones in there. I'm saying. I'm saying that eighteen they, year olds, sixteen year olds, fifteen year olds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, I'm, they, I'm talking they, about yeah, those, yeah, those, yeah. those, those well, ages. I've, well. I've seen men in their early twenties with very low testosterone. Yeah. But what you do is you always try to optimize their lifestyle. This is what one. I'm saying. Yeah. So you get rid of all of the phytoestrogens in the diet. So there's a but also heavy consumption of pornography, bro. Yeah, and and yeah, yeah. and whatever the, the whatever so, so, comes so, with pornography, the yeah. physical so, act so, of relieving yourself. So so all of that has yeah. an effect on your endocrine system, yeah. on your dopamine release, on all of the facilitations of end, of of the hormones. We're talking about how about phytoestrogens. There's a whole thing about the soy boy, that guy who's just taking loads and loads of soya. Yeah, and soy's got phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens you forget have a negative impact on your on your brain pathways <laughs> and as a consequence reduce your test levels but I think we need to go through that this is a split, yeah because I this think is this is a really big topic yeah it's a big it's topic and I feel like it's multiple podcasts bro and I think I f- it'd be amazing if we start <clears throat> but okay so you train every day bro but I, I have to I because if I don't then my body starts falling apart has to and break down. Tra- not only that but my mindfulness goes swimming helps me with my, with my mindfulness helps with my energy levels I look forward to swimming, look for, and also weightlifting is very lazy. It's fun. It's not high impact. Yeah. I'm not doing like hits training and lifting. Ah, no, I'm just taking my time, doing my sets, doing what I enjoy, getting some muscle, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, if you want, uh, you know, release energy from it. And then the swimming obviously helps with my cardio, helps with my breathing, helps with my recovery, helps with my mindfulness. We know that half an exercise a day is the equivalent of taking an antidepressant. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, there's loads of studies on it. Well, not a full antidepressant, probably a half antidepressant, but nevertheless, it has an antidepressant effects on you. And I think that's key, especially in today's society. We've got all of these external forces putting pressure on our mindfulness, you know, and, and, and working out has to be something that's fun, enjoyable, and is, persi- and is consistent. Yeah. And this is where the issue lies. Consistency is the key. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. If you have that regularly and you enjoy it, you're going to maintain it. And that's why I think things like weightlifting is fun. You know, I don't do a grappling art, obviously, do jiu jitsu, absolutely wrestling. No, I agree that. with it. I'm just saying, for well, some sort of combat view, sport, yeah, absolutely, to implement and the weightlifting yeah. and the stuff like that is just something supplementary, but it's something that you can do regularly and you can do it, yeah, you know, and I think it's fun. Barclothic, coach, Zakalof for coming down, and um, everyone at home, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next one.